about the, the amount of time represented in this group with just the time that you took off to be here, the amount of money. And so both of them are praying. I'm feeling like all kinds of pressure because of all the time and money that's gone into this. But I do want you to know that uh, I, I really hope that what God will do in the evening sessions and the morning sessions with the heavy hitters, that I, I hope that what he'll do is do something that changes our life. Did you come this week wanting the Lord to change your life? Man, I hope you did. This is an awesome time for all of us to, to get away from the routine, to uh, get away from work, to get away from the typical responsibilities that we have. It's a, a great time for us to be able to fellowship together. It's a great time for us to dive in this book. And listen, it, we do these things typically because what we really want to do is we want to we want to go home and be more committed to Christ, more determined to live for God, so sold out to him that regardless of the trials that may come to us in the next 12 months or whatever, that we're just going to keep trying to live the Christian life. We want to be full of faith in our ability to to, to live the way that God wants us to live. But listen to me now. What would you think if I told you that the very last thing that I want by the time that we leave here on Saturday afternoon is for us to be more committed to Christ, more determined to live for Him, more sold out, more tenacious in trying to live the Christian life, more full of faith in our ability to live the Christian life. What, what if I were to say that to you tonight? You, would you think I was crazy? But listen, that is what I'm saying to you tonight. In fact... Those things that I just mentioned, you know, we, we talk a lot about the abundant life that, that Jesus wanted to give to us in our salvation, eternal life and, and abundant life. And we, when we talk about that abundant life, do you understand that the things that I just mentioned are the very things that are actually Keeping us from tapping into the abundant life that Jesus wants to give to us. Now, if you're listening to what I'm saying, and I know we're early on in this thing, so you probably haven't been listening. Welcome back for those of you. But, but listen, if you're really listening to what I'm, I'm saying, I'm hoping... That right now you're thinking, what in the world is this dude talking about? Because if I'm hearing him correctly, what I just heard him say is that he doesn't want us to be committed to Christ. He doesn't want us to determine that we're going to live for God. He doesn't want us to be tenacious about trying to live for him. He doesn't want us to be full of faith in our ability to live the Christian life. And, and if that's what you're hearing me say, then listen, you're hearing exactly what I am saying. Because that is what the, the, the whole point of what we're going to be talking about tonight and for the next several nights and, and to, to, to actually get you to see what I, I'm trying to say is I want to set up tonight some, some key contrast between our natural inclinations about what we think the Christian life is, our natural inclinations about what we think God wants out of us, and set those against... God's biblical intentions as he reveals his truth to us in his word. And one of the main things that I want to say to you, that I want to make clear, is that the difference 
between our natural inclinations and God's biblical intention is somewhere about 20 to 40 years. And let me explain what I mean by that. I, I'm not going to go into the whole thing that I often do in talking about Israel's exodus, but let me remind you that in 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 10, what Paul does is he walks us back to Israel's exodus and shows how their exodus was like ours. And you'll remember that God brought them out through the blood of the Passover lamb and God's intention in bringing them out of Egypt and the bondage of Egypt. He says on three specific, specific occasions that the reason that he brought them out. Anybody remember? Bless you. To bring them in to Canaan. Listen, into a, a whole different type of existence. A, a place of fruit bearing. A place of abundance. But do you remember there was something between the exodus where God brought them out. Something between that and Canaan where he brought them in. And what, what is this called, y'all? It, it's, it's the wilderness. And, and listen, what he tells us in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 2 is that it was an 11-day journey from that place and that existence to this place and this existence. An 11-day journey that took them how long, y'all? Took them 40 years. And so when I say to you tonight that the difference between our natural inclinations and God's biblical intention is about 20 to 40 years, I'm talking about the time that you and I spend in the wilderness trying to figure out how to live for God. And what we typically do is we live according to our natural inclinations about the Christian life rather than what God has revealed in the truth of his word. Mm. And so tonight, I have been praying that God would somehow help us to see this thing, again, not from the way that we typically see it, but the way that the Word of God actually has revealed it to us. And now with that set up, I would like for us to pray together. And some of you may at this point be at a point to where you might want to say to God, God, I have no idea what this guy's talking about right now. But I want to. And so would you pray that God will allow me tonight to communicate this in a way that we actually see what God wants rather than what we typically think. And would you just ask the Lord and in, with, in the sincerity of your heart, man, just pray what David prayed. God, open thou my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your word. Would you pray that? Let's pray together. Now, Lord, there has been so much that is already gone into tonight the next several days and Lord we don't want to waste a second on anything trivial on anything that is not going to open our eyes to the reality of who you are and what you want for our life and so Lord I, I pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit on me tonight, pray for a fresh anointing on my brothers and sisters as, as they worship through 
the, the hearing of, of the Word of God. And so, Lord, would you, would you please show yourself mighty in this place tonight? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's start looking at these contrasts. Uh, tonight and tomorrow night, I'm going to be talking about four of, of them. But we're just going to look at one tonight. This is the first night you've been traveling, trying to get here. And I, I, I felt like this one might deserve just a little more time than the other three. Because if, I think if we can get the mindset of, of what I've already tried to set up tonight, it can... It can help us the rest uh, of the week. And this, this first one is a doozy, man. It's, uh, it's not really hard to understand. But I will tell you that it's going to take not looking at the Word of God from our natural inclinations, but from what He is actually saying here. We've already mentioned this, this first natural inclination. Look at it in your notes. Our natural inclination is to think like this. Okay, Jesus died for us, and now he wants us to live for him. And I mean, you know, we, we, we hear a statement like that. Had I not already set it up, we would be probably saying amen right there. Now you're scared to say amen, aren't you? <laughs> and, and, and I mean, it almost goes without saying that, I mean, my goodness, if the God of the universe died for me, how in the world could I not possibly live for him? I mean, it makes all the sense in the world. And I mean, it even taps into our sense of gratitude for who he is and, and what he's done. And, and so usually it kind of happens like this. Okay, there's different stories, but I think that usually... This is the way that it works in the Christian life for a good portion of us. We get saved, and of course, in salvation, immediately we get implanted into us the very Spirit of God, man. And the Bible becomes a new book to us, man. We're starting to read that. We go to church and we start hearing stuff that we have never conceived of before. And man, there's all kinds of changes that are being made in our lives in those early days of, of coming to Christ. And, you know, we're in it for a few months and we kind of think, I got this. I, I, I think I can do this. And whoo, all of a sudden, man, that flesh comes back, doesn't it? And, and we start understanding what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 7 where he says, Oh, God, man, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I end up doing. And, and, and so what typically will happen is, you know, we're, we all that jubilance about coming to Christ and then the reality of the flesh and the whole, the flesh warring against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and we find ourselves in all of that. And then we'll go to all church retreat. Or we'll, we'll go on a mission trip. Or we'll be at a conference somewhere. We'll go to a revival meeting. We may just be at a service in church. And man, the Spirit of God is working. And I'm really being serious there. And I mean, he's really stirring. And man, we'll sit there after that war with the flesh that we've been feeling. And we start to shake our head, man. And we're like, okay, that's it, man. I'm done. <laughs> and we make this huge determination. And, and it's typically like this. Okay, because of what he did for me, I'm not going to do what I want to do anymore. Dad gummit. <laughs> I, from this day forward, I'm going to live my life for Jesus. And here's the deal. We think that that's the victory that God was wanting to give us. And we go away thinking that God has been trying to bring us 
to this place of resolve, this place of sacrifice, this place of commitment. And by golly, we finally did it. Okay, now listen. When most of the time, what actually happened there is we started down a path that's about a 20 to 40 year path of flesh driven determination and commitment and self discipline that's really all about the suppression of our fleshly desires rather than the transformation of our fleshly desires. Are you hearing that? Yeah. Uh, my, my, little, my little girl is 33. <laughs> I was gonna say my little girl. Uh, but when she was a little girl, see bro. <laughs> He's had all the fun he can stand already. <laughs> But when she was a little girl, uh, it, I, when I was a little kid, I was freaked out of my mind of The Wizard of Oz. You know what I'm saying? That, that movie just freaked me out. <laughs> this little girl just absolutely loved every part of that thing. And, and so I, I, I'm a dude that has watched The Wizard of Oz about 50 times in my life. And about the 49th time, I went, hey. There's a message here. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty quick, y'all. <laughs> but do you remember at the beginning of the, of the movie, you guys are dialed into Wizard of Oz. You guys are almost Kansas, you know? <laughs> Surely you, you know that movie, right? Okay, so at the beginning of the movie, you know the black and white part? Do you remember that? Okay, and, and here's Elvira Gulch. You know, okay, she, you can already tell this. This is a witchy woman. Okay, you, you can see, man, that she is something. She's ticked off, man. And so she rides the bike over to uh, Uncle Henry and Aunt M's house. You remember this? And she gets off the bike. She's got Toto in her, ba in, her, in her basket. She gets off the bike and she says, Henry, I want to talk to you and your wife right away about Dorothy. <laughs> and, and listen, man, Henry is the man. Henry says, he, he's working the pipe. Dorothy, well, what's Dorothy done? Well, I'm all but lame from this bite on my leg. Oh, she bit you. <laughs> no, her dog. Oh, she bit her dog. Eh? <laughs> For real. I mean, you need to watch this 50 times. <laughs> I'm telling you, I got this movie, y'all. <laughs> and so she goes into the house, and oh man, here is Aunt M. Do you remember Aunt M? <laughs> this is precious little lady on the prairie, and Elvira Gulch has given her the devil man and she's talking about Toto and how she's gonna have that dog incinerated and she's talking, she's wagging her finger in her face <laughs> you guys can't see that in the back can you <laughs> I, I, I've got this look of I'm really nice all on my face you know Aunt M is all you know cowering and then mm, Aunt M has had it and she says, Elvira Gulch, for 32 years I wanted to tell you what I think about you. And now, well, being a Christian woman, I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, y'all, I had a moment with God on the 49th time. <laughs> when she was saying that, welcome back, bro. <laughs> <laughs> because do you, do you hear what she was saying there she was saying 
For 32 years, I've hated your stinking guts. <laughs> but because that's not Christian, I've never really acted on it. I've just kept it inside. And so it's all good. And we look at M like, what a saint. <laughs> but she ain't. <laughs> and we think that the Christian life is about suppressing the desires that are on the inside and as long as we're not acting on them then we're good uh, what I'm hoping that God will do over the course of the next several days is let us know that that is not the Christian life that God's called us to live. And the victory is not a whole bunch of self-discipline to not do what we really want to do. But listen, we got to be careful because the flesh wants us to think that that's the victory. And the flesh makes us feel good about our decision for Christ. And the flesh makes us feel spiritual about our commitment to Christ. And the flesh will perform. And the flesh will keep us from what 2 Corinthians 7, 1 calls the filthiness of the flesh. As long as we're holding on to what the same verse calls the filthiness of the spirit. And because we're not acting, doing the filthiness of the flesh, we feel like, okay, I must be living the Christian life God wants me to live while on the inside of us, there's all kinds of filthiness of the spirit. And you see, then listen, this is why through the years, and this is, you know, I'm sure it's tripped you out as much as it's tripped me out, but this is why we can see people and they're walking with God and they're living for God one day and they run off with somebody else's spouse the next day. And we look at that and we go, how in the world could that happen when most of the time, it's very simply the fact that the same flesh that was generating the suppression of the flesh, are you listening, has flipped. And now the flesh is giving us the expression of that flesh. If you're not hearing what I'm saying, talking about the filthiness of the spirit, is all up on the inside. And the, the flesh is suppressing those desires, keeping them on the inside. And if it's the flesh doing it, y'all, it's the flesh. And when it flips, here comes the filthiness of, of the flesh. And, and listen, I want to make sure that we're all understanding that we cannot underestimate the deceptiveness of the flesh. Because do you understand this? The flesh can motivate you to read the Bible. The flesh can motivate you to pray because we feel good about ourselves when we're doing all that. And, and, and as long as we're not really hearing what God is wanting us to hear. Man, the flesh is grinning. Okay, so that's our natural inclination. Jesus died for us, and now he wants us to live for him. Okay, now, now let's look at God's biblical intention. Okay, we start at the same place. Jesus died for us. Now he wants to live through us. And, and, and I know there's probably some of y'all that are thinking, oh, 
four schmore through schmoo. It's semantics, dude. And, and listen, I would beg to differ with you. Because there, there's actually a major difference. It's not just, you know, the, the same principle in different terms. No, listen, we are talking about two different principles and two totally different approaches to the Christian life that have two totally different outcomes in the judgment seat of this life and certainly at the judgment seat of Christ in the life to come. But... Listen, my brothers and sisters, there is all the difference in the world between me living for Christ and Christ living through me. Because as I'm about to show you, one tends to the power of the flesh. One tends to the power of the spirit. And that's the issue. Mm -hmm. But listen, many times our, our blind Laodicean eyes can't see it. But you know what's interesting as we begin to actually look at what God says in his word? This is in your notes. The, the God who always chooses his words very carefully, never tells us to live for him. Do you hear that? And again, I want to say, man, it is not semantics. And, and yet, what will happen is we read verses, and that's what we hear. And we're to live for God now that we're saved. And what I want to say to you and show you tonight is that God never says that. Last year we had the screen that went down to the floor. I had to be, you know, in a Presbyterian pulpit on the side. And so I, I should have known that Tad and the other guys were going to get that fixed. So I said, I ain't going to do that this year. And so we, maybe tomorrow night we'll have PowerPoint. But I put all the verses that we're going to be looking at on your sheet. So between looking at me and looking at the verses, we'll, we'll have some fun. Okay, look, look on your sheet. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15. This is, a, this is a classic illustration where Paul says, And that he died for all. And there it is, what we've been talking about. Jesus died for us. That they which live... Should not henceforth live unto themselves, but, but what, what does he say? For him? No, what? Yeah. Unto him which died and rose again. And you know what the difference is between living for Christ as opposed to living unto Christ? I'd say about 20 to 40 years. <laughs> Because notice, twice in the verse, he clearly says that Christ died for us. And he had every opportunity in the world to say that our response should be to live for him. But he doesn't. He tells us our lives are to be lived unto him. And the word unto... In this verse, it shows up twice in the verse. Listen, it's the idea of the direction of our lives. Look, look in the middle of the verse. Whereas in our lost condition before coming to Christ, we lived unto ourselves and everything about our life was directed unto or toward ourselves. But now that we've experienced the power of Christ's death and resurrection in our lives, listen, we've been freed from that self-focus so that now our lives can and should be directed unto and toward Christ. Would you look at the verse? There's nothing in this verse. When he had every opportunity in the world, there's nothing in this verse about me living for him because he died for me. 
And, and someone still may be thinking, you know, I think you're straining at a gnat, man. What's the big deal? For him, unto him. Well, I'll tell you what the big deal is. Would you look at the next verse on, on your sheet? It's because Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, and man, I, I hope that you have ears to hear this. What, what Paul says in this verse is that he wanted to be found in him. That's found in Christ, which is an incredibly theological thing that God did only for those of us in the church. He put us in him, sealed us with his spirit. And Paul says, that here's the deal. I want to be found in him, not having what? My own, My own <laughs> righteousness. And, and I want you to notice that there, there's something, even for those of us who are found in him tonight. There's something that Paul refers to as our righteousness. And it seems like I may just vaguely remember God giving us his mind about our righteousnesses. Back in Isaiah 64 in verse 6 when he said through Isaiah that all, what? Our righteousness is, in other words, all the things that we do for God are as filthy rags. And, and I don't want to be graphic, but those filthy rags are exactly what you're thinking it sounds like they are. And our righteousness is obviously something that we produce. And we do it by the determination of our will. Would you look at the next verse? This is what Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23 calls. You see it there in the verse? A show of wisdom in will worship. L listen, y'all. What Paul's talking about is our pharisaical ability to implement man's wisdom to give the appearance or the show that we're living a holy and godly life when all that has really happened is because we really worship at the shrine of self. Self-will has kicked in and suppressed the desires of the flesh and self-discipline has kicked in to cause us to do all kinds of spiritual looking and attention getting things that have nothing whatsoever to do with true worship or the power and filling and control of the spirit. Is anybody hearing that? Yeah. Jesus let us know in John chapter 4 and verse 23 that true worship is that which is generated in our spirits by the truth of the word of God to bring honor and satisfaction to God as opposed to the false worship that he's talking about here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23, 23 a false worship that is generated, listen, by our will because of our Luciferic desire to worship ourselves. And he says at the end of Colossians 2, 23, which is very honoring and satisfying to the what, y'all? To the flesh. And would you look back at Philippians 3, 9 again, where Paul says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, again, what I do for God. He says, which is 
of the law as opposed to of the spirit. And then Paul further clarifies the point, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Notice, not of me by my effort, but of God <coughs> by faith. In the same chapter, the verses there, back in verse 3, it, it, Paul gives us here an incredible definition of, of what it is to be a Christian. Would you look at it, Philippians 3, 3? He says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and, and have how much confidence in our ability to live for God? No. No. And have no confidence in in the flesh. God help us to get there. Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, it's on your sheet. For of him and through him and to him are all things. And again I say, never for him. still think it's semantics. <laughs> I, I put this as a, a note in, in your notes. Some of the people in the Bible who created the most problems for the will and work of God weren't people who were seeking to do something wrong for themselves, but people who were seeking to do something right for God. Are you hearing that? Okay, and, and the illustrations are numerous. I, I'm just going to give you one, and we're going to put a bow on it, all right? The illustration that I, I think crystallizes everything that we've been talking about, about me living for God, it, it is what happened in the life of Abraham and Sarah. Will you work with me a minute on Abraham and Sarah? You remember how the story came down? A Abraham was 75 years old and God took him out of his tent and he says, bro, I want you to look up in the sky and I want you to tell me uh, how many stars do you see? A lot. <laughs> takes him out to the, the beach and shows him the, the sand and he says, hey, how many grains of sand do you see? Do you see? And you know what he said? Uh-uh. A lot, a lot. <laughs> okay, and, and God says, okay, that's the nation that's going to come from you, Abraham. Okay, now, of course, at this time, Abraham was 75 stinking years old, and at that point, he's never had any kids. And what God was saying to him seemed absolutely impossible. But Galatians 3 6, it's in your notes, says, Abraham, bless his heart, man. You talk about somebody full of faith. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham said, God, I believe it, man. But my boy still had to go home and explain this to his wife. Okay? Wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall when, when old Abraham comes in and is going to break this out for, for her? Because part of the thing that you need to understand is on two separate occasions in the book of Genesis, the Bible refers to Abraham as well stricken in age. Okay, Brother George is going to be speaking to you tomorrow morning. I'm not saying he's well stricken in age. I'm going to give you boy some props here, man. Listen, I don't know of a 71-year-old that looks as good as that dude in all God's people said. Amen. Okay, I would not say 
that he is well stricken in age. But what 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 the Bible's letting us know is that Abraham was not like Brother George. What, what, what are you saying? This is not going where I wanted it to go. I, for real, I was going to give you major props, Abraham. But when, when it's talking about him well stricken in age, what it's saying is he's not some spry 75 year old. Okay, and, and what it says of Sarah is that she was past the manner of women. You talk about a discreet way to say she can't have kids anymore. Okay, so so just imagine this. Okay, so Abraham Abraham comes home, all well stricken in age, and he says, Sarah. God spoke to me today. And here, here, here's Sarah, all past the manner of women. Rod spoke to you. Who's Rod? I didn't say Rod, I said God. Maybe you ought to come over here and sit down. What God said, baby. I can't call you that, can I? God said, I don't even know how to say this to you, sir. He, he said, you're going to have lots of babies. And, and she believed him. That's what the word of God says. And, and I would imagine a few months later, Abraham's probably checking in with her. How you feeling, baby? <laughs> you, you feeling overly tired? <laughs> you feel like you got to go to the bathroom all the time? <laughs> you got that cute little pooch going on? And, and so, you know, three months goes by, six months, nine months, a year, and then two years, and three, and four, and five, and ten years, and check it out. Abraham is now... 85 years old, Sarah is 75, and still no baby. And so Genesis chapter 16 says that Sarah says to Abraham, Did God tell you we were going to have a baby? Yeah, he did. Are you sure it was God? <laughs> uh, I've been wondering that myself. <laughs> And, and, and he says to her, well, maybe, maybe God didn't realize how past the manner of women you were. <laughs> and she says, well, maybe God didn't realize how well stricken in age you are. <laughs> so they're doing the whole husband and wife thing. But for whatever reason, listen, with the promise of God still ringing in their ears after 10 years, there's no baby. And so you know what they did? They dedicated themselves to carry out the will of God. And they determined that they were going to do something right for God. And Sarah suggests, you know, what? Oh, all right, let me kick into my old woman voice. But she says, well, why, why don't we have the why don't we have the baby with my my handmaid Hagar? And so you know the story, thinking that they're doing something for God. Abraham goes into Hagar. She becomes the mother of Abraham's baby, and he they named him Ishmael. Okay, and so life goes on. Man, they're cruising along, thinking that God is pleased with their determination and their decision for Christ, their commitment to him. And, and here's Ishmael. He's 13 now. So Abraham is 99 now. And God speaks to Abraham for the first time in 24 stinking years, man. And, and, and God says, Abraham, you remember how I told you that your wife would have a son? And Abraham 
uh, yeah. He says, well, this time next year, your wife is going to give birth to that son. And Abraham says, uh, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to have to inform you about this, <laughs> but we already have a son. Uh, he's 13. He's out playing football in the backyard. <laughs> and Genesis 21 says that Sarah gave birth to that baby on the exact day that God said that he was born, would be born. And so now Abraham has how many sons? He has two sons, Ishmael, the teenager, and now Isaac, the baby. But you know what's interesting, y'all? Okay, don't miss this. Do you understand that God never recognized Ishmael? Listen, he provided for Ishmael. He loved him. He gave him the dignity that he gives to any other human being, but he never recognized him as Abraham's son. You remember in Genesis 22 when God told uh, Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice? Did you ever notice the deliberate mistake that God made when he spoke to Abraham? Genesis 22, verse 2, look at it. God says, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. Did you ever notice that? Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. <laughs> And do you realize that when God said that to Abraham, Abraham could have said, uh, let me correct you on that. I have two sons. Why did God call Isaac his only son? Well, Galatians 4.22 tells you why. Look at it. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, Hagar, the other by a free woman, Sarah. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born after the what, y'all? Oh, the flesh. Listen. It was man's doing. There was nothing supernatural or divine about it. It was the result of what Abraham did for God. But go on in the verse. But he of the free woman, Isaac, the son born of Sarah, was born by or was by or born by, listen, promise. In, in other words, Ishmael was the product of the flesh. What Abraham did for God. Isaac was the product of the spirit. What God did through Abraham. And here's the point of the whole message tonight, you the Christian life is never, ever, ever about what we do for Jesus. What we do for Jesus, it may make us religious. It may make us fundamental. It may make us feel Christian. It may make us feel spiritual. But the fact of the matter is, y'all, God is not interested in what we do for him. Ready for this? And he doesn't even recognize it any more than he recognized Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And listen. Listen. 
that may, for some of us, not be revealed until the judgment seat of Christ. Because, listen, what we do for God is wood, hay, and stubble. And God's going to light that fire. <coughs> and just like Sir Pro, like it never even happened. Just like Ishmael doesn't even recognize it. What he's interested in is what Jesus does in and through us. You know what would be an awesome thing tonight? For some of us to get on social media and say, hey, I'm at a retreat and I made a major decision tonight. I'm no longer going to live for God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm serious. Amen. Amen. Do you understand that, y'all? And, and, and again, I, we're here this week to talk about the crucified life. Okay, this is the first time I've said the word. But that's what we're talking about, y'all. And we'll get into more of this tomorrow night. But listen. This is, a, this is an incredible group of churches, an incredible fellowship that God has put together here. And there's a lot of zealous people. And what I fear is that some of us are going to wake up 20 years from now and recognize that the flesh has been generating a lot of spiritual looking activity that's going to go up in smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. Now listen, this isn't hard. What, what Paul feared is that we would be moved away from the simplicity that is in Christ. What we're talking about is not hard. What we're talking about is getting the barnacles of our natural inclinations out of it and get to the place where we really understand that Christ has been working in our life, and we'll see this in great detail tomorrow night. Christ has been working in our life through the circumstances of our life to bring us to the place where he can live through us. And again, I say the difference between me living for Jesus and Jesus living through me Lord, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear what, what the Spirit is wanting to, to say to us. I, I pray, Lord, that uh, as we go down this, this path of trying to understand what the crucified life actually looks like in real life. That you'll get us off of the treadmill of trying to live for you. Get back to the simplicity of you living through us. And we ask these things for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen.